Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 567. That is 567 of the Agostino Zynga show. I hope it is finding you well wherever you may be in this godforsaken earth that we're currently spinning on at hurtling speeds while we still think we have enough time to do what we really want to do when we don't really. Wherever you are, I hope you are having a fine day. Where have I been and where am I? You know, trying to do the best I can with the time I have available. Took a week off, I think, from the last episode that I uploaded, maybe more than a week. So, um, you know, forgive me if you've been waiting around, all 10 of you. Forgive me. But I'm back here in the hot seat, ready and willing and able to dissect whatever cultural news I can with some semblance of honesty and, you know, whatever else I can kind of ascertain from this brief time that I have available in front of you right now. And if you're wondering, oh, Ag, why haven't you been around so often? Where have you disappeared to? To be honest, I kind of got bored about talking about the same old things again and again and again. There's only so many hype drops you can talk about, only so many raves you can talk about on C, only so many, you know, this stand-up comedian did this, he did that, she did that. It's just like boring. And I think my, the straw that broke the camel's back for me was obviously that whole Kim Kardashian work hard stuff. It was such a non-story. It didn't really you know, it was such an obvious thing to kind of get clicks and generate a reaction, which we all felt victim to, then all the kind of custody battle stuff is going on with Kanye and him, it's just, it just felt like we're constantly being drawn into their vortex of BS, and considering how crazy things are in the world right now, right, we've got parts of Shanghai being locked down, we've got the ongoing war in Ukraine with the invasion of Russia going on there, we have things going on in Yemen, crazy stuff going on in Somali now at the moment, and yet here's the things that we're concentrating and focusing on it just feels like an absolute mockery of this you know beautiful gift of life that we've been given this one opportunity to kind of make something of ourselves and to experience things and to i don't know start families have a great i don't know whatever whatever right whatever you've been putting this earth to do it just feels like such a robbery of time to be concerning yourself with such trivial matters that don't really matter that don't really matter in the grand scheme of things and it kind of got a bit annoying hearing me speak about the same old things again and again and again because even i 500 episodes deep near approaching 600 even i can get tired of the sound of my own voice i know it's hard to imagine and it doesn't really make any sense but even i can get tired of the sound of my own voice and i really was when it comes to all this cultural commentary stuff going on so you know if people tell you oh this is easy to do and it doesn't require any semblance of hard work or whatever honestly for me it's been the opposite, the opposite doing cultural commentary stuff has really kind of made me question my intellect it's definitely decreased my iq levels <laughs> i'm not lying having to read some of this stuff and form some semblance of an opinion like ah yeah 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 and i hate honestly i hate being hot takes mcgee i hate being hot takes mcgee because i honestly do think all this time being spent having these hot takes on social and on podcasts could definitely be put into writing a book that could be of use to people in the future that could get passed down to generation to generation again i'm being a little bit you know I'm, i have a little bit of an inflated sense of self there in terms of you know as, as thinking that i will have a book worthy enough of that stuff but considering the amount of books out there getting deals and people out there kind of riding on the coattails of some of our intellectual greats i'm sure i could muster some semblance of a 500 page book that would have some kind of way of kind of maybe encapsulating the times we're in now without wasting all of my time giving it away for quote unquote free on social media like i am doing like we all do um it just gets annoying you know what i mean that guy guy or girl that on constantly online giving you their flipping unfettered opinion that you didn't ask for about whatever cultural thing going on at the moment it just gets boring after a while like don't you have enough hearing your sound of your voice but i guess similar to selfies they just keep coming in it they just keep coming so i thought you know what let me jump back in the hot seat and kind of contribute what i can and obviously today is probably one of the hottest days to do it based on what happened in the oscars but i think going forward my plan is to continue to obviously do kind of what I'm doing, but to kind of pivot into doing actual more culturally significant, culturally significant stuff like, um, you know, reviewing stuff concerning the arts, like actually watching or rewatching documentaries, films, 
um, going to exhibitions again, getting inspired, you know, I mean, to talk about things that actually matter or things that I feel like actually matter that might be of some rev relevance or use to you guys over there, of course, as the viewers, consumers of this kind of stuff, because I don't think shows are fun when it's just, okay, let me just give them what they want. It's also fun when the person doing it also feels somewhat inspired, somewhat rejuvenated by the things that they're reading, you know what I mean? Or or writing or watching or listening or seeing and they want to kind of somehow relay it back to you guys. Obviously, maybe the audience can kind of see some sort of value of it. But if I'm just sitting here and kind of go by what my, you know, I could easily just sit here and go through my video clips, especially on YouTube and kind of sort through popular or most viewed and basically be able to deduce, okay, people like me when I hear, when I talk about these topics, firing a the kid, these comedian that, this, that, 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 and just go through those topics every single week. But legitimately, I'd want to hang myself if I did that. Like, I couldn't do it. I just can't because I would want to have a an original thought about some of those guys involved in that circle right or in that scene whatever which would then have to which would then require me to actually sit down and listen to those shows for the most part i don't listen to them i just see the clips online i might jump on the joe rogan subreddit i might jump on the t fat k subreddit and see what clips have been posted on there maybe comment or something if i feel like i've got something interesting to say but i don't sit there and listen to them so that's why i give those guys props because they actually listen to these shows and pull out clips upload them on streamable and whatnot so they don't give these guys guys clicks or views or whatnot and i just couldn't do it i really couldn't there's not a part of me that feels like that is in any way meaningful or any use or any good use of my time even though you know my time isn't worth much now yet but i still want to honor it i don't want to kind of be wasting it considering you know again everything going on in the world the last thing i want to be doing is wasting any time that i have available so yeah if you're wondering where i was and where i've been that's basically what happened had a bit of a crisis of confidence concerning those things and kind of back to where I most of it but hey here we are here we are so i'm gonna crack onto the show I'm not gonna waste more of your time because why would i do that i've got a little mug of tea here ready to sip on so if you have whatever you need to get going and grab that and we're gonna jump right in never bet some tea okay first things first where have i been on the weekend so i've been out for i've been going out quite a bit actually pretty decently mostly one night a week um because sometimes my days are for middle of the week so i can't usually do weekend stuff which has been interesting because i definitely try to avoid going out on fridays because from my experience having spent some time promoting parties for like what five or so years mostly in a similar sort of area in east london the common the common thing that you go into it thinking naively when you're doing promoting is that oh you're gonna make loads of money on halloween you're gonna make loads of money on fridays you're gonna make loads of money on new year's eve and usually those are the hardest days to make money because there's so much competition with other things going on you know around town and usually fridays are usually the worst time to go out especially in that sort of like shoreditchy dawson sort of area you avoided going out on the fridays because that meant everyone was going out on Fridays because that was when everyone finished work especially around that area Liverpool Street Old Street where people have offices and stuff that usually a member even in the place I used to work at not sure if you have guys have the same thing whether much you put city you're based in but there'll be times especially if it was like a payday weekend that fell nicely on like the end of the week some of the girls there would you know be buying stuff from like ASOS or whatnot um H&M whatever store they're buying for outfits in mind of going out on that Friday and it'd get you know do the makeup at the end of the day maybe sometimes on Fridays you might end the day a bit early so if you stand there ending at six you might end at five five thirty so they'll get glammed up and they'd go out and they'd basically change at work and then leave their stuff and then pick it up on monday when they come in obviously first um first day of the week so that meant you had a real cohort of people leaving to go out after work at the end of the week on friday and you also had the people who went home and came back out again so fridays have always been a bit of a myth for me so i've always avoided them and i've always kind of try to make my days out usually on the saturday um or the thursday kind of an odd one to do but usually thursdays especially wednesdays back in the day in shoreditch those areas hoxton haggerston hackney wednesdays were a sick night to go out on because usually that was when you could avoid all the kind of you know regular normie folk and usually them far more interesting nights in terms of music people could take more chances because you don't want to just hear boom bat boom you know boom 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 for the whole night you could take chances a bit more eclectic in terms of the crowd and the mixture of people age ranges blah 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 so the whole friday thing is a bit of a myth to me but obviously the last few weeks i've been doing it quite often and it's also been quite cool because i think we're in a weird post pandemic sort of time 
where it does for the most part as i mentioned plenty of times on here there's definitely a decrease in the amount of people that are outside no one can deny that for sure and i don't think those people are ever coming back because i think that was a kind of normie ish crowd that you know a lot of people in the dance music industry took for granted people or maybe even us in terms of seeing people we kind of look down upon them but those people who would maybe buy a ticket to love box who would buy a ticket to you know whatever festival happens in you know like a dick mantle or whatnot those normie crowd people who would fill the gaps here or there were the ones that sold stuff out because there's a core group you'd imagine the core sort of fan like myself maybe other people who follow these artists who buy you know songs on juno and you know visit record stores who go to flipping Fonica for the little indie dj stuff and maybe listen to nts just kind of a core kind of fanboy type person and then there's a normie kind of person who just listens to whatever it's cool maybe checks out what's the most trending or ra pick of an event on ra you know buys a thing that's got marketism on instagram but those people definitely help to kind of bolster the numbers but they've gone now so the nights out are far different than what they were prior from what i've seen i think i've seen festivals be the same for the most part especially the big ones they're still four the ones that that should be four are still four but the other nights are kind of it's a mixture and so far i think from the times i've been in london or i've been out in london sorry i can't think of a single night with maybe the exception of that time i went to fabric to see ricardo play and of course it's ricardo but i can't think of a single night in london that i've been out so far that's been legitimately full like full like okay we are full i think a lot of the even the sellout events i've been to were lies they were kind of sellouts in terms of oh they sold out of the allocation online but not actually sold out of tickets you can still get them on the door if you go early so it's a bit of an interesting one so when i go out so when i go out now at the end of the week which i went out the other week to fold for this event called mannequin presents uh, sorry, Four Presents Mannequin Records, um, featuring a lineup of Ricca, um, Alessandro Adriani, Face Fatal, and Jess. And legitimately, it was a really fun night. Far more busier than maybe previous nights I've been, because maybe they have, I think the DJs playing have a far more of a pull than the people that I saw prior. But overall, the crowd, as per usual, obviously, you know, always the best over there. I think it obviously helped that I arrived quite late. I think I arrived at like. 1 32 a.m after i watched the ufc fight night i was still kind of you know glued on watching that so i kind of had to kind of wait to kind of get that over and done with before i could leave which was a bit of a bad move because it meant i didn't have much time to rave but you know because i got my bike now i could just jet over there in like 15 minutes if that which has been real handy it's obviously a bit of a myth on the way back if you know what i mean but going there is cool um, you know just got to make sure i pick the right tire to kind of cycle there but usually it's just fine it's not too much of a, of a hassle there's lampposts and kind of fencing right outside the club so if you just lock it up there and it's in a really dead end area you're not going to have passers by trying to go there and nick your bike so that's going to be pretty decent um i had a bit of a hiccup a bit of a scare just before i arrived i was sorting out my lock before i got to the venue and for some reason i guess i dropped my phone without realizing because my, my music was still playing and then i only realized because of the music's Stop playing because I was out of distance. And then by the time I popped around the corner, another guy was walking down the road because he's just kind of his car and he picked up the phone. I was like, Oi! And he turned around and just gave it to me. But he wasn't going to give it to me. He was walking away. Do you know what I mean? It was like, Jesus Christos, mate. That would have been an absolute mad one to start the night off with. Um, first thing again to complain about, just because, you know, it's good to be honest about these sort of things. As great as the venue is and as great as I love everything that they do over there, one of the things I'm a little bit annoyed about still is the lack of set list being published you know especially on the same night as the event i get you don't want to do it beforehand i still don't get it don't get me wrong because i think it's just nonsense i think if the best club in the world like Berkheim can put out their set list a few days before the event can, is going to be on i think these other clubs can do the same thing for sure um in the uk i know for sure beforehand the idea around it was that you didn't want people to just come to see the person playing you wanted them to turn up to see the whole thing because i guess it's not enough to just get the ticket secured because some of you would think oh what's the point of doing that holding onto the set list and kind of holding people hostage or making sure they come so they can you know get more money in the bar well effectively they bought a ticket anyway so you've already made that back but i guess some of these events or some of these spaces they they've got such a high operating cost they just have to kind of try and get black as much money as they can black get back as much money as they can from every avenue so if they can guarantee that you 
are go- but I'm gonna buy a ticket and then also guarantee that you're going to arrive um with enough time for you to drink and you know spend at the bar that kind of increases their ability to recoup but somebody that goes out a lot it's just annoying not to know who's playing or what you're missing before you get there now don't get me wrong common sense would tell me that the way they put the lineup together that most likely the headliner would be jazz considering the level of people out there especially she put out an album recently you know that makes more sense and then maybe the one before would be faith faith town knowing his connections and him being somebody that plays at all the big venues out there in berlin i'm not i'm not familiar with alessandra adriani but Rick i've seen a few times on whore on hi we pronounce that flipping radio station in berlin so common knowledge or common sense would probably tell you that most likely this is the opening then next then next then ending you would assume so but i would still want to know ahead of time don't let me get there and then find out when i get there obviously when i got there i was able to take a picture of the set list because they do have it on the side of the toilet so i guess if you've got your take your phone taped up you're not going to take a picture but you can just note it down if you want to they've usually got the set list you know on the little bit of paper next to the toilets there in the main room so that was fine to get the set list and then by the time i was there face face tower was playing i think he just started as he arrived there maybe at 2 30 so that was pretty sick to see um that sort of like let, let's just call it that quintessential sort of berlin sound or how should you call it uh whatever try and figure whatever other place to call it that really hard fast techno is something that is slowly but surely be not so but surely it's becoming a lot more popular here in the uk right in london especially but i still feel like for the most part just because of how we're set up it still takes a bit getting used to to kind of really enjoy it because of the times that we're open you know for the most part fold is one of the places that closed you know one of the latest clubs that close um, in terms of closing time sorry so 6 a.m is still quite late for us even though it's not really late in all things you know all things considered so it takes some time to get used to especially for myself if i'm arriving there at half two and it's closing at six it's a bit of a myth even if it did start at 10 8 p.m don't get me wrong but most places you know especially if you go to let's use berlin as an example even though it's but it's not a fair example to use but still you know the events are starting at 12 you're leaving there by like maybe 10 a.m maybe 12 a.m the next morning so you've got a lot of time to really get into the groove so that's the only thing that's a bit of a concern i feel like for me especially that sound forget the time that i went there i think just more so the the kind of tempo uh the feel whatever it may be right it's just it requires you to kind of get into the groove but because it smokes you over the head so quickly you don't force to kind of just figure it out which was fine i figured it out i thought face of the was was wonderful um even though it was really banger heavy i felt like he did a good job of kind of carrying the groove and sort of providing a platform for jess to come on after him which i thought was a really standout set um somebody that i've kind of been a fan of for a while and i think i was meant to see her play if i'm not mistaken there was a venture was meant to play. It might have been at some. It might have been at the. It might have been at the other venue they have, whose owns fold. What's it called? The glove that fits. I think so. I think I bought a ticket to go see her play. The glove that fits is meant to be an event there happening, um. But then I think that happened. That happened to coincide when the lockdown happened either here or in Berlin, and obviously that event got postponed or got cancelled. So maybe this is the makeup one. I'm not too sure. But regardless, big fan, and she was amazing definitely a standout set for the whole time i was pissed i had to go outside for a few minutes here and there to kind of gather myself whatnot but definitely one of the standout sets there was just uh, really 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 good just health as telter skelter again very groovy which is probably the only difference you see from these kind of high level sort of like berlin djs and what we have here in london i think we still got really really great techno djs but i think for the most part because of how you know our clubbing scene is set up there's not a lot of groove you kind of have to go in with an hour set of bangers ready to go you can't really vibe your way into a night but you feel like with the berlin crowds because they're used to playing longer sets or maybe they're used to playing sets at weirder times they're used to kind of having tunes in their arsenal that can kind of you know 
um, work up to a really high 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 crescendo and i think that's what ended up seeing at jazz because by the end of it everyone was hooting and hollering screaming and shouting you know giving her loads of love myself included and you could definitely see that she had held everybody's attention for the majority of that set towards the end so that was really really cool to see and of course at the end everyone was looking for the after parties to go to which i kind of participated in knowing for what i wasn't gonna be able to stay because i'd work the next day so that was a bit funny and then I think most people ended up going to Unfold the next day, actually. It was on Sunday, which I still haven't been to. For all the times I've been, again, I went to the very, very first Fold party, which I'm actually going to upload a really funny little audio clip of me in the toilets, high up my mind, you know, giving them all the props. But that was funny back in the day. So I've been to the first, first party when they opened up like 2018 or something. But I've never been to an Unfold. It's just because it's on a Sunday, you know, I can't wrap my head around going out to a rave rave on a Sunday, but I think I have to kind of give it a little look in going forward because for the most part, they have some really interesting bookings in. That's where they even give a lot of the young up and coming talent a chance. People that they may be looking to make residence in the future, they get a shot to do that there in it. So maybe that's an option to go forward. But yeah, as per usual, one of the best clubs, great bartenders, like it's stuff that you shouldn't be able to you shouldn't mention because it should be you know par for course but if you know anything about london club and you know how up and down you know temperamental that stuff can be and how much it can really influence your night if you have a really bad experience of a security guard or something but i think like everybody's there is usually really cool easy to talk to um, searches up chill ticket thing is easy id blah 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 obviously the cloakroom stuff i would keep mentioning is a real godsend if you want to leave them in the lockers um for sure you can do that especially so i'm a big fan of that um and yeah generally just a good night so i really really had a good one with that one looking forward to more i think the next one i'm meant to be going out to is maybe the techno mate which is happening on friday this week and if not that then obviously hold out for the berlin weekend happening in a couple of weeks i think it's the weekend of um, weekend of like the 15th 16th so that might be a good one but yeah it's been a pretty decent one in terms of going out on a friday all things considered because i guess the pandemic has essentially reset the clubbing scene in a big big way the people that were going out prior to the pandemic have definitely moved on to other things and um, it's now left some room for people to do interesting stuff so why you're seeing all these cool little festivals pop up and alternative nights here and there he she day or is that how you say he she day or day she hey budokai you've got inferno you've got all these crazy cool nights popping up out of nowhere that have really been propped to prominence i think mostly because there's now room to do stuff people want to take chances they don't want to just go to the same old same old thing anymore um, you're seeing less of the bait sven var flipping bookings happening all the time which do happens for the most part maybe print works there to get all the bait bookings but for the most part there's loads of interesting things going on even in places like e1 e1 the other day had ellen allian playing which i got it i missed um she was playing there recently the other day so it's like they really try and um kind of diversify the nights more because you have to ha you have to try more interesting things to get people to come out now because people have maybe been I would say conditions, but they've got used to enjoying themselves at home now. So if they want to give them, and obviously if you're working from home, you you don't really have the benefit of, you know, club places don't have the benefit of you already being outdoors. You're indoors. So they really need to make the lineup or the party compelling for you to actually leave your house to go to this place. So um, pick up everyone, you know, trying and, you know, putting their best foot forward and trying to make it work, especially the club bookers and event promoters and whatnot. And obviously the people that are going out for the most part have a really good attitude, man. I'm not going to lie. I've not had any bit of trouble at all being out to these places. So that's definitely been a plus on that one that's definitely been the plus in that one um so moving on as per we're going to talk about obviously the thing that's been on everyone's lips um the confrontation between will smith and chris rock at the oscars and for the most part i would have to start off by saying it's incredibly 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 cuck and incredibly gay to be standing there or to be on social media um you know going out of your way to back any of these guys right multi-millionaire uber celebrities who for the most part have committed their lives to playing make-believe and pretend in order to kind of put food on the table for their family right you're kind of like an adult baby for the most part this is what your life has basically been whittled down to so the fact that they don't need you know the 
sympathy or the kind of uh, concern from the regular person who's just trying to keep the lights on and pay their bills they don't need it it's just another part of their silly silly story especially nowadays there is no such thing as bad press you could just use anything to kind of propel your career further and further forward first thing second thing i'd say about the whole thing is that it's incredibly incredibly lame of Will Smith to do it in the first place to hit or to slap Chris Rock because of the joke that he said that he felt like you know was maybe crossing the line and maybe hurt Jada, Jada Pinkett Smith's feelings incredibly inappropriate and if I'm and in all honesty it may be exposed who Will Smith is more as a person than anything else and maybe it was a little bit of a revelation or a kind of indication for us lame people and us normies out there that all the things that we've been saying online about them as a couple, the memes that have been shared, the jokes that have been made, have definitely been getting to them. And it maybe is also a revelation that this whole kind of rumor or this idea, this story, whoever put it out there first, that they had some sort of open relationship and whatnot, blah, 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 that there's definitely some division or there's some kind of um, difference of opinion in terms of who wants that sort of arrangement. Because for the most part, we've definitely seen a more emotional, emotionally unhinged and somewhat nervy Will Smith ever since that Red Table talk where Jada Pinkett Smith kind of revealed that she had that entanglement with August Alcina. We've definitely seen a different version of Will, which would led me to believe that he was probably the person who was less down or willing to do the whole open relationship. Let's just call it a, you know modern marriage sort of vibe sort of thing it probably was never something that he was really down for which is weird because i remember hearing when that story was put out the other theory was that oh the reason why will isn't tripping is because he was also smashing margot robbie on the side allegedly which you know maybe he was doing but maybe it was just a smash and it wasn't a full-on relationship with a flipping 26 year old rb singer who knows whatever it may be clearly it looked like from the outside looking in Will Smith was less inclined to live that kind of lifestyle Jada Pinkett maybe wanted that more so cool no problem but then we were force fed um or we were kind of forced to pay attention or to listen to Jada Pinkett Smith kind of reveal every intimate detail about their relationship her feelings about Tupac all this really I would say somewhat embarrassing and somewhat um kind of uh you know real life cuckification of will smith happening in real time and for people like myself who grew up on the fresh rooms of bel-air who grew up on will smith just being a really inspiring figure who grew up listening to his interviews kind of you know trying to figure out how he became so cool and so successful the things that he's done and what lessons can be learned and applied to stuff that i do or we do in general it really is sad to see somebody that you would kind of portray as some of a hero be kind of subjected to this right kind of turn into a, sh a shell of his former self where he's essentially turned himself into like some sort of um glorified version of a youtuber online because i think that might be as well another inception point of kind of wasn't career when he had to sort of pivot into being a social media influencer for the for, the, for lack of a better term when he appeared in the youtube uncensored remember that kind of clip with him looking at the binoculars that was maybe a signal that his star power was definitely dwindling because he's also always been known as the box office guy right the guy would you know put out one or two killer box office movies every couple of years or so and absolutely smash it regardless of what the movie was and over the years it didn't really work out that way things kind of changed society changed TikTok happened social media happened right suddenly no one cares about these hollywood stars anymore which w would also you would imagine kind of lead you to understand why you know they created stuff like red table talk right because for the most part no one is listening or caring for jada pinkett smith's acting career as much as they are caring about what she has to say about family and relationships and whatnot and you know navigating hollywood as a black woman blah 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 blah, blah. all that talkity talkity stuff has definitely made her i would say more prominent and more of a kind of household name than any of the acting things that she's done in the past i would say personally but many people will disagree but regardless lamo lamo i'm a free speech absolutist personally i believe you should be able to say whatever the hell you want without the threat of violence obviously you are not kind of um you're not kind of responsible or in control of how somebody reacts but i think the moment you lay your hair on some you lay your hands on somebody when they've just used words is the moment you've lost you should always respond to threats as they come 
threats of violence should be addressed with threats of violence threats with words should be addressed with threats of words you shouldn't be standing out of your seat in the middle of a flipping packed room live on air going to slap someone because of a joke they said especially when we know that the person that you should be slapping is walking to South Cena. At the time when we were making our jokes online, I actually played a video in the background just so you can hear it, but <laughs> I'll mute the sound because we wanted to hear it. At the time that we were kind of talking about publicly about the whole Walker South Cena, Jada Pinkett Smith thing, you know, it was, it was kind of, they kind of made it seem like he was being the mature one by never sort of replying or saying anything about it, right? But we all knew as guys as especially as men that the person that would really need to get a slap in the if we're being serious behind closed doors would obviously be jada pinkett smith for allowing that guy to come into their home to kind of nurture him and protect him and kind of look after him and help him out and all that nonsense and then it turned into some sort of relationship that should be the first person that should be getting a slap behind closed doors and the second person should be august Arsene himself not everyone around him that was making jokes or whatever it may be that was that was ridiculous but if anything, it goes to show how, I wouldn't even say it's contempt. It feels like for the most part, these celebrities have like a weird, they have weird requirements that they placed on public, right? They sort of like force us to pay attention to their private lives that we don't care about for the most part. Most of us don't care. We're just forced to care about it because they talk about it so open, so openly. And, you know, there's nothing else to entertain us, you know, especially in media or in culture or in arts at the moment. TV series are dog shit. Oscar movies are terrible, right? There's nothing really out there to kind of distract us apart from maybe sports and reality TV. And again, those, you know, depending on what you're watching, aren't that great anyway. So they force us to pay attention to their personal lives. But at the moment, we have an opinion that doesn't line up with what they want to hear. They then tell us it's out of context. They then tell us some mind of business. They didn't like all this dumb shit happens, and you're like, "What the hell is going on? Am I living in a bloody matrix? Am I living in a matrix where I have to sit there and somehow um, justify in my own head why I think somehow that I agree with these aliens? Because that's what they are. They're like adult babies. They don't really exist in the real world. Why maybe having a relationship that's open but not open?" And then sharing your story with millions of people isn't maybe the best way to go about things. You know what I mean? It's just a very strange place to be in. And I think for the most part, the lamest thing to come out of this whole situation has been the lack of support for Chris Rock. The lack of support for Chris Rock, especially when it comes to comedians coming out and saying, hey, this is completely uncalled for because, yes, it's Will Smith, but this could be anybody. This could be some random person you know, at some bar somewhere that doesn't like what you say. And then they get up on the stage and they, what, they they fucking double leg you and start pounding you into the ground because they don't like the joke that you made about Trump. <laughs> this is where it goes. And I think it's completely unnecessary and completely uncalled for. If you don't like what you hear, you walk out and you leave the room. But at the end of the day, it's a bloody joke and a very tame one at the end of the day. What you'd want to see from comedians is they all rally around and a few of them just get out there and release an entire special, put it up on YouTube with just non-stop 30 minutes full of insults and jokes towards the, the, the Smith family and just saying, hey, you don't control how people, you know, um, you don't control how people maybe respond to your crazy lifestyle, to your unconventional way of parenting, whatever it may be, because most people don't live the way you live, which is the reason why you get to get the big bucks, because we get to watch you like zoo animals, but you then don't get the right to come out here and tell us what we can say, how we can say, it, or in Will's case, physically assault us because you don't like what we said. That is completely not on. If you don't like the limelight, you don't want people to have an opinion, then retreat pull away from public life completely renounce your you know your movies your roles or whatever it may be and just live in complete privacy then of course you can command that or you can request that but for now like shut the fuck up really shut the fuck up and it gets worse because that was bad enough as it was the worst part about it was the apology if you're gonna be the guy that's gonna be like hey i've had enough of all the jokes i don't want anyone to have any more jokes at my expense with my family you know, we've been through enough already, blah, 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 whatever it may be, stand on it, stand on it, if you're going to be the bully boy, stand on it, if you're going to be, if you're going to be the, the baby of acting, stand on it, but don't then come out now and say you're sorry, or that you apologize, because we know you're not sorry, because at the time, especially when it had stuff happened, number one, I was surprised the show went on, the show continued for some odd reason, they didn't stop the show, for some odd reason, he wasn't escorted out of the building, for some odd reason, he still was able to receive his award on stage, 
right like straight after i think that actual slap happened for some odd reason there was a video of him after the event um no or when it happened crying in the arms of tyler perry and denzel washington did they go up and give chris rock any condolences another black man that got sold on stage or are we picking and choosing which black man gets support now like what nonsense is this then there's another video of will smith and after party dancing and rapping along to his crappy songs you know trying to make himself feel good like what the hell is going on here now you've got an apology what's this apology for who is this for is it so you can keep your oscar nonsense absolute bullshit so anyway the apology on screen is as follows you post on instagram it says this violence in all its forms is poisonous and destructive my behavior <laughs> oh god my behavior last with academy awards was unacceptable and inexcusable jokes are at my expense are part of the job but a joke about jada's medical condition was too much for me to bear and i reacted emotionally I would like to publicly apologize to Chris. I was out of line and I was wrong. I'm embarrassed at my actions and were not indicative of a man I want to be. There's no place for violence in a world of loving kindness. Yeah, there is, but not in that way. Um, I would also like to apologize to the Academy, the most important people. Have to, and again, is that paragraph longer? Yeah, see, the, the uh, paragraph apology to the Academy and everyone involved in Hollywood is longer than the one involved to Chris Rock. Um... I would like to apologize to the Williams family, the King Richard family, and deeply regret... Who's the King Richard family? Okay, the, I'll get the movie. I deeply regret my behavior as stained that what uh, what was ha what has been an otherwise gorgeous journey for all, of, for all for all of us. I'm a work in progress and sincerely will. It sounds very Lex Friedman-y, isn't it? This, isn't it? Love and light, love and kindness. Like after Lex Friedman finds me on the streets and strangles me to death, he's gonna say love and light. <laughs> <laughs> I kill you with love, I kill you with light. Like, what nonsense, what hobbity group. If you're going to be the violence guy, stand on your violence. I don't vibe with any of this stuff. You know, Jada Smith needs to grow up as well. Jada Pinkett Smith, grow the fuck up. Like, legitimately grow the fuck up. If you have a problem with this alopecia stuff, again, it's just, for me, it's, it's attention seeking at its finest. If this is an issue, wear a wig. If you don't know one to take the piss out of you, let them know beforehand, hey, don't say this, because I'm sure some of the biggest celebrities out there, if you need, if you especially considering the weight that they have as a family, they can definitely put in a word and say, hey, you know, I don't want you to mention my hair. Now, if you're a comedian worth your weight, in, you know, in gold and you're actually about this life, you're going to listen to them. You're going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're still going to say the joke. But grow up. If it's that annoying and it's that pissing you off, like wear, wear a bloody wig. And also maybe stop embarrassing your husband in public so he doesn't have to emotionally react this way. If this is what you, if you know he's what he's like behind closed doors and that he has a bit of a temper, especially when it comes to you, you know, he doesn't really tolerate disrespect. He doesn't tolerate anybody moving to her in public when he's, in a, you know, in, in the vicinity, all these kind of things. Don't put him in harm's way. There's nothing worse than those type of women, right? That know they've got a guy who's jealous and possessive and they consistently put him in scenarios where he has to display the jealous and, you know, uh, possessive kind of traits that were maybe kind of toxic in those kind of environments. Don't do it. Or if it gets that bad, guess what? Break up. That's what I think they should be doing. Grown ups, maybe just get divorced because clearly they're not aligned in the way that they're kind of going about things. And it's not a bad thing. They could still be some of the greatest co parenting couple, especially celebrities known to man. They could write books on it, how to navigate this world, whatever it may be. But just maybe get divorced, innit? And don't subject us to all this nonsense because we generally don't care. No one was caring about the Oscars beforehand. They tried to make us. You know, force us to care about it when they hired flipping Amy Schumer, who everyone hates. Then she got the genius idea of maybe getting Zelensky to do an address, you know, um, live over Skype or Zoom at the Oscars to, you know, get the attention of the global audience. Imagine that. Imagine Zelensky trying to um, grab the attention of everybody in the world concerning what's going over there in Ukraine with the invasion from Russia and then having it spliced in between Will Smith walking up and slapping Chris Rock in the face because of a joke he didn't like. Imagine, imagine, imagine the optics on that one. So that we, it didn't work, all those things to get us attention. And now look at out of the blue, this convenient event happens that grabs us all by the, you know, by the seat of our pants and we're now all gripped by it and sending all the memes around. I think it's a nonsense. Either get divorced, keep your private life private or just give up your celebrity and leave us alone either way i don't care i really really don't care anyway let's move on let's move on um united news um united news so uh 
obviously most of you guys know i'm a massive united fan and obviously most of you guys know if you listen to the podcast that i've been relatively realistic about my expectations going forward with the club i feel like ever since the glazers came on board with the exception of the Sirs ferguson reign it's never been successful you know maybe to some levels of success you could say you know europe leagues here and there uh, finishing second here and there champions league finishes here and there cool but generally in terms of kind of getting back to the heady heights of winning league titles and actually challenging for champions leagues and maybe even winning a couple of domestic cups like the fa cup or league cup we haven't come close on a consistent basis ever since the glazers have been in charge and the main reason why is because the glazers the way they run around the club is very commercial heavy they're more focused about trying to sell t-shirts expanding our global reach engagement bloody blah, blah 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 than actual sporting success which for the most part is a very backwards way to think about things because weirdly enough in football if you're actually successful on the pitch it can actually make the you know the plan to kind of maybe expand into new territories far easier because you have something to basically offer these fans have maybe don't know much about you you have glory you have you know cup goals you have excellent bits of play you have all these assets that you could use along the way to kind of get that glory that you could use obviously to expand your global audience but we don't do that instead we focus mostly on the commercial side of it and we abandon the football we think about the football second and then we also have the added uh, you know pain in the ass where we've given people jobs very cushy jobs who don't have any business of being the jobs that they're in you know the bankers who all got put in place when Edward was there loads of his mates from the you know, same university they went with together the Glazers for the most part have a very hands-off approach and let them guys run it how they want to run it and just pull out the dividends and the unfortunate part of that when it comes to United is that it would be okay if we were able to stumble across another Alex Ferguson, which is odd to say, but if we were able to do so, if we were able to kind of, you know, we hired David Moyes and he happened to be the next reincarnation of Alex Ferguson. The sad thing was, it wouldn't matter. No one would care about football structure. But unfortunately for us, football's at a point now where structure is probably the most important thing in football maybe ahead of transfers and stuff i would say because you know you're, you would, you could argue that your structure informs your transfers without adequate structure then your transfers are going to be dog shy look at how well a club like chelsea you know operates and runs itself especially in the midst of everything going on with Roman Abramovich. they're able to still keep chugging along for the most part because their structure is pretty watertight but with united you remove people like peter kenyon and you know flipping Sykes ferguson and maybe some other key figures and suddenly it all comes crumbling down on the football side of things and now we're in this affair now where we hired michael carrick after Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was sacked which i think too late Ole Solskjaer was definitely sacked too late we hired we then put michael carrick in place as an interim then we got Ralph Ragnick in charge as another interim who also was going to, under the guise that he was going to go upstairs and consult with John Murta, who is far overqualified there and far more, you know, is far more success in that field than the John Murta does to assist the likes of Darren Fletcher and John Murta. Darren Fletcher then drops down and somehow is on the bench assisting with the club. I'm not sure what that is all about, what that means, anything, but for the most part, it's another illustration of just how poorly we're run. He should be nowhere near the football side of things. He should be doing a job that he's meant to be hired for. And now we have a position where we still haven't hired our next permanent coach. According to this article or this tweet, sorry, courtesy of United District, it says, Man United want their next manager to imbue the, um, to imbue the club with a strong playing entity, giving Eric Ten Hag an edge in the contest. A desire to develop a playing style figure to permanently lead the plans outlined by United. But still, considering we have an international break, since the end of season is coming up soon, we have nothing else to play for. We still don't have any pre-contract agreement in place with a manager going forward. Zero now my kind of um theory is that for the most part i feel like especially considering the noises coming out of the club considering what gary neville has said about pochettino recently put out a poll on his um, twitter feed basically asking fans who they'd rather eric ten Hag or pochettino the overwhelming favorite on twitter was 80 percent vote was eric ten Hag, but then gary neville still said he'd want pochettino anyway which i can kind of give him a bligh on because for the most part he's always been a fan of him and also pochettino did coach in the premier league so Gary Neville was able to see firsthand how he was able to kind of develop his career, you know, working at, you know, Southampton, eventually going to Spurs and get them the highest finish they've had in recent years and, you know, transforming how they play football and blah, blah, blah. Fair enough on that regard. But 
there's too much noise around Pochettino's name when it comes to United. The fact that he was always somebody the club wanted to hire but kind of didn't. I don't know why, you know, a few years ago. And if anything, my opinion would be we probably hired him too late now. We probably should have hired him when we maybe were letting go of, let's say, uh, a Mourinho. Maybe he should have been the person that should have come in at, at that time. So maybe three, three and a half years too late. But the noise around him is just too substantial for me to feel like there's any, any other candidate in place. I think the only person that the club really want is Poch. And it feels like to me that they're biding their time, waiting for Poch to maybe get fired from PSG, which it's looking likely, especially if they don't win the league, especially considering the, the kind of the flipping head start they have with everybody else in the league. I think there are many, many points in front of the second place team. So if they can win the league, if they don't win the league, and they also let go of Leonardo, who's meant to be having butted heads with some people in charge of PSG, and people have looked at him as being the person responsible for how poorly they're put together as a club, bloody blah, 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 blah. If that's the case, then that's going to afford May United the ability to not pay any compensation, to not pay and you know, to not kind of get him out of his contract. And if there's one thing we know about United, they love to save money and they love to get stuff just for clicks and views. So if Pochettino's their guy, and they can save money on him by waiting for him to get sacked. Then this whole charade about interviewing people and, you know, whatever, presenting ideas and having a short list, this is the perfect way to go about it. Because if anything, it puts out this idea to the fans that they are actually trying to be well run because they clearly know that the people like myself and other fans don't think the club's well run and feel like we're run by a bunch of jokers. So if they're able to kind of pretend like they are well run and sort of go through the motions then this is a way to kind of appease the fan base when they do ultimately make a decision because what will end up happening is that a bunch of top reds will end up telling people like myself, oh, relax, the club know what they're doing, Poch is in for a reason, back the manager, all this sort of nonsense. When I think in general, Poch's track record, especially in terms of bottling stuff, is quite evident and quite true. And also I think considering that he would generally require transfers and money in order for him to be successful at the club as apart from coaching is going to be an issue and the fact that I don't necessarily think he's going to be able to compete with some of the better coaches in the league um, especially nowadays some you know in the same way players fall off I think managers can also fall off and I think what we've seen with Poch so far is a manager on the decline for the most part now he probably does need another job in between um, you know, his stints, you know, that he's had obviously at Spurs and obviously now going, you know, when he's at flipping magic you know, what in between after he probably needs another job after PSG to kind of restore his reputation for sure. If he's able to go to Seville or Real Madrid or whatnot or whatever club he's meant to go to next and actually win things, then for sure you can say, Okay, Poch is back. But for now, Hiring a poch, considering how lackluster we are, considering the revolution that we actually need, considering all the prima donnas we have in this club, I think is a bad move. Really, really bad move. Interesting enough, uh, Louis Van Gaal said this following um, during the international week. He said, Eric Ten Hag should join a football club and not a commercial club. May United is a commercial club. We all knew this, but it's great to see the great man Louis Van Gaal telling it as he sees it. Another quote says, Mr. Pellettino was recently interviewed by Man United. According to sources close to United board, United also indicated to him that they do not intend to rush into the choice of their future coach. But clearly, he's one of their favourites, I think still. Another one which is more concerning, apart from the managerial changes, I think, is this quote. It says, Rashford and Shaw are considered part of the key group of core players at United want to keep at Old Trafford and are keen to push ahead with negotiations despite uncertainty of the identity of the club's next manager. I personally think clubs like Chelsea can get away with this. Even an Arsenal for the most part can get away with this. Maybe a Liverpool even. Um, a City for sure can get away with this where you don't necessarily sign players based on managers choices maybe preferences like maybe they want a left back with certain playing attributes core cool, but you have an overall idea of how you want to play football and you just sign players based on the kind of gaps you need to fill your squad and then you get coaches secondly who kind of can maybe uh, what you call it um, can play that kind of football can coach that kind of football cool then it won't necessarily matter if you sign players you know to a contract extension with no manager in charge because essentially you're going to pick the manager they're going to most likely use his player because you know what players you kind of want playing style wise but united we don't have a playing style we don't have a way that i think is going to be um we don't have a clear identifiable way at the moment that's definitely going to get us back to where we need to get to 
that needs to be worked out and the only way to work that out is to allow the managers to bring in the players that they want now kind of uh, tying his hands behind his back before he even starts the job by giving him players that are not going to fit the way he's going to play or maybe are not his preference is definitely a recipe for disaster but definitely par for course when it comes to United we are probably at the most crucial maybe you'd say even yeah maybe definitely the most crucial part of United's evolution going forward as a club because I've always said from the day dot that I don't think we'll ever be a club that's going to win and challenge for major honours until the Glazers leave the Glazers are the most destructive and uh, hurtful part of modern day United they're the ones single-handedly holding us back the ex-players don't help with their stupid opinions and their sort of like loyalties being basically decided on who pays them the top reds don't help with their sort of weird in a competition thing about trying to see who's the best supporter by ignoring the things that they're clearly seeing there's clear issues and obviously the players at the club who are toxic and entitled and have the ego that doesn't really match their kind of sporting achievement or their abilities cool but the number one thing holding back the club in my opinion is the glazers and until the glazers leave we are never going to be successful but if you told me we're able to get a genius coaching who can maybe quicken the process who can maybe shorten the amount of time that we're in the sort of footballing wilderness i still think even with that genius manager in charge who i don't think exists because i think sort of think the best managers available on the like in the world football have already got jobs and will never come to united anyway so if that's the case you're having to go with whoever's left out there at the moment i still think it's going to be a minimum of five years before we're actually challenging for league titles challenging to win the you know top european honors such as the champions league and definitely winning maybe a couple of domestic cups like league cups fa cup i still think it's five years between getting there some would argue maybe longer because we still have to establish ourselves as a top four club which we're not but it takes us five years minimum now with the Glazers, if they hire the wrong person, every time they hire the wrong person, it basically adds two years to the process because the first year doesn't really count. And then the second year, maybe is when they get their second tra their transfers in and whatnot, they maybe change the look of the squad. But every year, every time they hire the wrong manager, especially from the outset, it adds another two years to the process. So it could be looking, you know, could be looking to, you know, eights and nines in terms of years, in terms of before we get in challenging again. So giving this new manager the platform of these players who have been for the most part part of really disastrous and unsuccessful you know united reigns uh players who for the most part have divided opinion when it comes to coaches players for the most part who other top teams wouldn't want in their starting lineup i don't think rest of the show get into any of the other top teams in the league's starting lineups where it might be sub or bench players but definitely not starting lineup players is definitely a recipe for disaster and I generally can't think of anything worse than what is being proposed at the moment. It's generally, generally shocking stuff. Um, another one, again, another thing concerning part, Bruno Fernandes has very agreed a terms of a new five-year contract, which again, I think is really crazy because he's going to be a player that's going to command, you know, a starting position. He's going to be at an age where he's not going to want to sit on a bench. So it's just going to create more problems. And he's definitely a player who definitely wants to play every single game. So why would you give this manager such a headache? Why not just give him the ability to come in, assess who he wants to assess, and then decide who's the player for him and go forward. If it decides that he wants to play McTominay and Fred as a double pivot, I will just have to accept it as a fan. But committing, you know, the likes of McTominay's and the Freds to long-term contracts and the Bruno Fernandes knowing full well that you don't know who the manager's going to be it's just crazy to me ridiculously crazy and just kind of puts us again into a corner where we won't be able to sell these players going moving forward if you give a Luke Shaw an extension he's essentially got a contract for life at United where else is he going to go he's going to retire at the club especially when you consider how long it's taken us to get rid of players like one matter Phil Jones is still at the club Jesse Lingard who definitely went to leave and made all the noises to leave is still at the club like come on so this idea of giving Bruno Fernandes a contract again I don't think is warranted especially off the back of last season um, maybe you could say he should get one because he's been the only person that's been you know especially for recent transfers who actually done anything but I still think everyone should be playing for their supper I think everyone should be going into this new point, permanent manager appointment not knowing if they're going to have a career at United everybody I don't care who it is no one in that club 
nobody with the exception of maybe Anthony Langer or something or some of the young players coming up no one in that club deserves to get a contract based on what they did prior because they've all been parts of really disastrous United Reigns you know United Reigns where they've essentially forced the manager out by downing their tools United Reigns where they've come out and said the most entitled nutty stuff about the training programs and having to train at night and all this nonsense they don't want to press like they're the most entitled bunch of players that exist they need a bit of humbling they need to be brought back down to earth and the only way you could do that is by giving the manager the ability to get them out if need be but signing these players to long-term contracts i think is a recipe for disaster personally but most likely than not they're going to do it anyway and we're going to have to just move forward as a club and it just kind of pray and hope it works out which it obviously won't because football's no there is no there is no there is no flukes in football you are where you are for a reason and United are just never going to get to that position again until I think, you know, we get rid of the Glazers. And unfortunately, there's no appetite within our fan base to really, just, you know, spark a change and call for it. And, you know, it just doesn't exist. I don't, and I just can't figure out why that is. I really can't. But hey, we have to move in it. Next one, this is this funny story courtesy of Hypebeast about the Omega Swatch Speedmaster worldwide release that legitimately sparked a riot on Carnaby Street, which brought back a lot of heady fun memories for myself especially considering the times that i spent you know queuing outside of stores in central london overnight getting the mcdonald's breakfast with people and stuff and then getting your thing in the morning walking back to the station with your bags or checking them in pox or in that what's that up square in top of road but you know what i mean right it's a great time and obviously with with the popularity of resale culture or streetwear or hypebeast culture whatever it, you know these kind of years gone by the need to queue outside stores has definitely dwindled a lot of places have basically favored the online drops and that sellout frenzy more so than the queuing things local councils got involved police were not too up happy about it and it's just kind of died that whole culture which i think is really annoying i still think there's a place to be had for having drops where you have people actually go to the store who want to go to a store if you have an allocation in store similar to any other brand you know your high fashion brands your electronic brands they're able to sell you know i phones and Balenciaga sneakers online and they also have an allegation that goes in store so if you want to go in the store and pick it up in hand without having to wait you can go and do so but for whatever reason they never make enough of these things in the kind of streetwear culture sort of vibe of stuff they always make a limited amount they kind of make artificial you know artificial scarcity and then they tell everybody that it's limited and then you know they they, they drop some ahead of time to influencers who then put them up online they get crazy resale prices, especially nowadays with people out out of jobs and you know bouncing around from here to here. They're gonna grab a you know a couple of watches and try and sell them for ten k too because why not? So you know they create they create a problem for themselves. But it's still nice to see such an unsuspecting brand like Swatch be able to kind of restore the feeling. It has to be honest. I have to be honest in that regard because it beats having to see you know queues outside of fucking Carnaby Street size to buy crappy Nike Air Max part of Nike Air Max day or something nonsense like that. No one wants to see that. Who cares? You know what I mean? It's the same old nonsense, same old tired routine. At least we're getting something interesting. You know, an actual Omega Swatch watch, an actual watch, an analog watch that people are going crazy for. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So it says the follows. Um, let's scroll down the article. It says Swatch stores across the world, from London to Geneva to Hong Kong to Miami, were swarmed on Saturday as Omega Swatch Speedmaster Moonwatch was released in stores. The Omega Swatch Speedmaster collection consists of eleven pieces referencing different planets and celestial bodies within the solar system. That's why you know it's hype. There's eleven different watches. Crazy, including the Moon, Earth, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto, Venus, Uranus, Neptune, and Mercury. The Quartz Moon Swatch chronograph. Um, references the mechanical Omega Speedmaster moon watch inspired by the NASA's Apollo 11 moon landing in 1969. Recently, of as of, as of, as of like what maybe a couple of years now, I've been super into SpaceX stuff. Right, I follow quite a few channels online where I just kind of you know get caught up on all things concerning um, space travel and whatnot. And it's been quite interesting to kind of get involved in, right? To kind of read some books, check out some documentaries here and there, blah 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 blah. So maybe. 
this isn't a coincidence maybe other guys out there too have also become a bit interested in that side of things especially with you know elon musk becoming like a new a new age celebrity in his kind of old age people have maybe kind of been inspired to check out that sort of stuff and the race to the moon the race to mars and whatnot you know intestinal space station maybe that's been the thing or maybe just watches in general have been a quiet sleeper that i haven't really been paying attention to but it's crazy it's actually crazy to see this is you know a watch like that is kind of commanding such a response it says the collection marks the first time swatch group luxury swatches uh swatch groups luxury omega brand collaborated with an entry-level swatch counterpart at its price point of 260 dollars which is really good all things considered buyers can purchase the entire level watch collection for much less than the original speedmaster moonwatch true while swatch has made it clear that the moonwatch is not a limited edition release so it's not limited thousands have flocked to the nearest swatch store and deployed in geneva and a store closure in central london due to the chaotic scenes unfolding outside the funny thing about all this stuff that always happens i feel like the more this stuff happens the more fucking what you call it um replicas come out this is the common adage the more you hype up this stuff where it's going to be high resale it just it just kind of bolsters that replica market and then it kind of cheapens the original product you put out there it's a weird sort of give and take i don't know if these brands know it and it just take the loss anyway because i feel like don't get me wrong if you're gonna buy a legitimate watch you're gonna buy it anyway you're not gonna go and buy the replica it's not gonna happen because you want the actual watch watch but if you just want the look and you don't care about where you get the watch it, it may immediately cheapens the original product that come out because the replicas exist because it's gonna be like it doesn't make any sense like because for sure once this is all done you know two months down the line you'll start seeing them pop up on aliexpress on all these other sites i don't know get mock whatever the gtx so there's other sites out there that kind of sell fucking rebo stuff like in it like an etsy or something you'll for sure see these pop up for sure i'm i almost guarantee this is going to happen so i don't really i don't know i think the whole like hyping everything or make or making it giving the impression it's limited edition it can kind of you know come back and shoot in the face um it says continues here it says while swatches made it clear da, da, da. according to the video interview with Houdinki, a buyer revealed that he traveled from las vegas to la and waited outside for more than 22 hours to secure the watch and is currently selling it for more than 10 times vision value on ebay and other secondary markets okay let's see how much they're selling it for actually on ebay let's see let's see if we can get an actual real life um kind of view on how much this stuff is selling for online because i bet you it's already kind of dropped in value because these things drop so so fast let's see what it's saying here yeah see it's it was 10k supposedly i'm assuming it was the first one so the first one i guess online before everybody else gets it, it's going to be 10k and then it's already been dropped now oh okay i've, I've got to check there so seven we got one from one thousand to seven. That's the pink one all once, right? I don't know what which, which one's that one. That's the mission to Venus is pink. The ones that everyone wants is gonna be the grey ones in it, the darker colours. So the Mercury, Neptune. Neptune is four thousand one hundred bids only. Mercury is seven thousand bids, 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 bids. Oh my god. No wonder people are going crazy. So if you can buy us for two bills and rip it, because it kinda you know it looks it kinda looks like as well. It kinda a little bit looks like um the Jacobs and Co. watches. Let's see complete items. Let's see if they got the complete ones. How much they've been going for recently? One sold already. Mercury for one thousand five hundred. Buy it now. One thousand three thousand five hundred. So maybe the other ones are inflated and they're kind of fake bids. I'm not too sure, but they're really going for crazy amounts. Someone sold off for thirty pound. That's a bit weird. I think, oh, okay, we postage to five hundred. So about eight hundred pound. God Almighty, they've been selling for a lot in it jesus christos absolutely nuts anyway uh go back to the article uh blah, blah, blah. for the for for those that missed out restock should arrive in the coming weeks at select store so yeah you'll be able to get them again so this is just hype for nothing really um this is a this is a watch this is a Q outside the what Covent garden branch of, of swatch that's a long Q. And the other thing that's clear too, this is kind of just a smile minor thing on my end. It's pretty evident how normy resale culture has got now because when you look at queues, you don't really see cool people. No, this is a weird point to make, but back in the day when we used to 
queue you'd see people that clearly were into the thing that they were queuing for whether they were head to toe wearing babe they were wearing some limited edition air max they were wearing some limited edition jordan they had some crazy jacket like you could always tell who was really about this life and actually living their raps right they were, they were maybe there to buy two to maybe flip one to keep one or you know whatever it may be but they were definitely a part of the culture they're part of the scene they loved what they were into whereas now it's mostly people just trying to flip they're basically people that are maybe you know they're more fans of gary v than they are of actually you know chris gibbs or is it maybe chris gibbs or the, the chris guy from union right they probably identify more with the gary v guy than the union dude which is i think something that i'm not really a fan of there's too many of these kind of normie guys just trying to you know hoover up these kind of cultural artifacts in the hope of kind of making a quick buck and you know for the most part i'd imagine you'd have to buy a few of these to how many you have to buy of these to make it worthwhile standing outside of a shop for 22 hours to buy a watch you have to maybe buy the whole collection of it but i'd imagine a few people that are buying them are probably only going to buy one or two to buy one or two to only make two and i say only but to only make a couple of grand especially nowadays in today's economy considering what you want to do with your life especially if you're out of work is that really going to move the needle is it really going to change things for you for the better i don't necessarily think so if it's money you're going to use to you know i remember back in the day when i used to do reselling of stuff especially stuff that i didn't want anymore you do it so you could just buy more things or to go on holiday right i remember even going to new york as the first sort of boys holiday back in the day i don't know when that was maybe like 2008 or 7 or something nonsense like that right I have funded my entire trip. That was a flight over there on Virgin Airways, um, spending money to go buy stuff at Supreme in actual New York for the first time ever. All of that was basically purchased. All that was purchased through reselling. Be able to flip shoes and shit was able to pay for that entire thing because at the time I didn't have a job. Right? I found it diff incredibly difficult to get my first job, especially outside of uni. Especially so after uni, sorry. Right? Because, yeah that was 2008 yeah, every, yeah i find it difficult to get an actual first job it's so so hard even just a sales assistant job i only got my actual first proper like job kind of paying okay in that kind of sales fashion -y world in 1948 because i knew somebody not because i was the best person for the job right i kind of got it through nepotism really for the most part um so you know being able to make that extra bit of money was able to do stuff that i couldn't already do but I don't think I could do reselling nowadays with the hope of maybe having it supplement my work wage or DJ. It just wouldn't make any sense. It would be something you do as an add-on, maybe to do other things. But again, 22 hours. And then, you know, you'd have to sell it within a very short window. You have to get it and sell it now. There's no, this doesn't acquire value over the time because, like I said, they're going to be restocks of it. It's not limited edition. And also, it's 11 watches for fuck's sake. Swatch have made a lot of money on this, but they want to make more. So they're going to make more of these. They're going to put them out again. And then by the time they put they get put out again, there's going to be tons of re there's going to be tons of fakes made already. They're going to, you know, these factories in China are going to see all the ones that sell the most and just rep them. You know it's going to happen. <laughs> That's a crazy queue. Oh my god. That's going for miles. Oh my god. And I bet you a lot of these stores like Swatch and stuff, especially in Covent Garden, are welcoming this because they don't probably get they don't probably get more than a hundred people through their doors on a on a busy Saturday. Do you know what I mean? So having all this extra attention is definitely something that they kind of welcome in. I'd imagine most of central London because people, you know, foot traffic there has definitely dwindled, especially after the pandemic. Or, you know, post-pandemic, all that we're living, especially in the UK. They're probably welcoming all this attention because they never, ever get it prior. Another scene here, courtesy of uh, the line at Chadstones for the Swatch Omega watch, easily 500 metres long. <laughs> Another video here showing the line, the Times Square, New York. Yeah. yeah, like I said, just a lack of cool people in the queue just automatically for me just makes it lame. Like, I don't know, maybe it's just again the, the hipster in me talking, but part of being a part of the scene and being into this sort of stuff was actually meeting cool and interesting people that you can legitimately like, you know, some of my 
bestest friends in the world i met through standing in queues waiting for hype release stuff that we sometimes didn't even get that's how hard it was right back in the day you'd queue for flipping 16 hours and you sometimes you wouldn't even get the thing that you wanted i remember the you know the famous story that i always talk about queuing outside of busy workshops one time the bape store upside on upper james street i think this might have been the release for the bape chomper varsity jacket right classic varsity jacket i think it was um, the one that uh, clips wore on one of the uh, one of the magazines or something i forgot anyway if you know you know and i guess at the time we didn't we weren't really pally pally with the bait people that used to work there but the people that used to queue in the front were some of the cunts that you know i won't name they they were really pally pally and they already had knowledge of how many they were coming in so they got there ahead of time before all of us knowing exactly how much were in stock they bought out the entire range and then there was nothing left for us to buy and i remember queuing outside that store for 11 i think hours or something and then getting in the store not being able to buy anything not even a hoodie zero was available and anything i had left had to I had to leave with something right that would have been denzel washington clip i gotta leave with something so i bought a flipping piece of sellotape like a roll sellotape roll babe one it was like 30 pounds it wasn't really cheap like something like a purple camo or something that's what i bought that's what i had to leave with because there was literally nothing available at the time and that was brutal but again I met some good friends there, had some jokes, you know, you shared your pain collectively because you're all catching L's. But this is just lame, just standing there because you're so social and, you know, no one's cool here. Just a group of people just wanted to what, flip this stuff so they can buy NFTs. Like, nah, man, I'll pass on that. Yeah. yeah, no one here looks cool. They all look lame as hell. I'm, I'm sorry, not, not that it matters, but... Yeah. Lost it. Lost it. Like, and maybe it's the privilege of the employed or in general, but I think I've got too much pride, especially nowadays, considering I feel like I put in enough work and I paid my dues enough in the world out there to be doing this myself. I couldn't do it nowadays. I just couldn't. It would have to be something really special to get me to get out of my house to queue. I'd much rather just pay resale. And if I can't pay resale, just buy a rep legitimately. There's nothing I can think of. That would make me want oh you know what would make me want to queue this will make me want to queue if they ever retroed um the original ones actually right so let's see if i can see if i can get if i can get one to sell here a bathing ape this is the only thing i would actually queue for let's see i'm looking for one like that's like early 2000s like a yellow camo color Let's see if I can find it on here. So this is, might be the only thing I would queue for, right? So I got it here. A baby nip snowball jacket, right? This is a classic grail that I've always kind of wanted in my collection. I've had a couple, but they were never right. I had one that was like padded. It's sort of, and again, I regret selling it. It was absolutely beautiful. It was like a padded down jacket. It's similar to like this snowball jacket, but it was obviously, you know, not shell, it was more padded, but it just didn't fit right. And then I had another one that was darker and smaller arms I had to sell. So I never had the perfect one I actually want, but if they were ever to release the Baby Nape um, snowball jacket in this sort of like yellow camo, right? Um, to the original specifications of how they were when they first came out, then I would go in queue for it for it in a heartbeat no way you know no way that i wouldn't do that but apart from that i can't think of anything else legitimately that i would queue for there's nothing out there worthwhile to queue for in that regard it just doesn't exist i don't think so anyway and even these are crappy these versions of it i'm showing you here at the moment let's see if i can get another one let's see if i just do vintage i think it might be like early 2000s or one i want actually it's kind of weird what one that's got this sort of label on the inside right um that's kind of the one that i would want with this sort of label so if they would ever release something like this then maybe you'd see me queue up again oh i think that might be, oh yeah this is the one i had yeah this is the jacket i had actually that i sold it was similar to this it was yeah this is the one puffer jacket how much is selling that for 538 i think i might have sold mine for far less than that actually to be honest embarrassingly enough so yeah, this this is the one I had. It was like a puffy version of the snowball jacket. Pretty sure. Let's see if it goes up. Yeah, yeah, for sure. The, the, this is the one I have. Maybe this I'd kind of maybe queue for, but a watch, a Swatch watch as well. Like, come on, man. That's like ridiculous levels of lame. I don't know why it's not letting me do it, but hey, let's just move off of this now. Get on my nerves. Anyway, let's go back to the actual watch itself and see what was available. Come on, you crashed. Don't tell me you've crashed.
Okay, cool. Good. So yeah, the watches themselves, you know, cool enough, I guess. It's it's maybe cool to see people buying watches again. Might mean people actually want to tell the time. I remember there was a time that I was actually looking to get another G Shock because I didn't want to keep looking at my phone when I was in the gym or whatnot or just out and about. It's good to just have a watch. Um but to queue for something that looks like a like I said, it's like a Jacobs and Co. version of a swatch. I don't know if that's the vibe for me really. Or are people buying them because they want them to look like fake Rolexes? I don't know. Some of these watches I think people buying, are they buying them because they're actually into watches or because they want them to look like a watch that they can't afford to buy? Who knows? But yeah, regardless, you know, it'll be a it'll be a cold, cold day in hell before you see me queue up with these things again. Like these guys play games with us for the most part, do you know what I mean? They invent these artificial points of scarcity. They get shocked and surprised when we go out there and try and make some money and try and flip some stuff. And then they then, you know, pull the, give us a bit of a rug pull and end up dropping them all again in the same colors, you know, in far more quantity later on down the line. But hey, what can we do in it? What can we do? Anyway, that is the Action Zinger Show episode number 567, I think I said. If it's your first time, check out the show. Um, thank you for checking it out. I do appreciate everyone that does check it out because, you know, I'm just a guy that just rambles into the camera, so any attention is good attention. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks again for tuning in. Keep an eye out for more stuff concerning me coming very, very soon. I'll see you guys very, very soon. Take care, be safe, and all that good stuff. Peace. <laughs>